Catherine, the music is not loud enough. Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone. My name is Rita Abrouj from the Palestinian BDS National Committee. I'm excited to welcome you all to the Israeli Apartheid Week 2022 Global Rally Against Apartheid. This rally comes as part of Israeli Apartheid, Apartheid Week which over the last 18 years has pushed discussion of Israeli apartheid and organizing for burqa divestment and sanctions campaign um, into the popular narrative. Since its beginning in 2004, Israeli Apartheid Week has organized thousands of events uh, in hundreds, uh, hundreds of cities worldwide. This week is a tool for mobilizing grassroots support on the global level for the Palestinian liberation struggle and other struggles against racism, oppression, and discrimination. Every year, from March to April, communities around the globe come together to organize inspiring actions and events. Thanks to Israeli Apartheid Week, Israel's uh, apartheid policies of systematic racism and oppression against Palestinians are increasingly difficult to hide and whitewash. Despite decades of ruthless ethnic cleansing and brutal repression, Palestinians from all, all parts of historic Palestine, as well as in exile, took to the streets last May 2021 to challenge Israel's re regime of occupation, apartheid, and settler colonialism. In the process, we have dismantled psychological colonial walls that divide us. Thus, this year, we plan to shed light on the role of culture, knowledge, and art in decolonizing our minds in our collective struggles against cultural appropriation and oppression. And in the process, we share global experiences encountering cultural erasure and imperialism. Taking place between March 21st and April 18th across the globe, organizing a series of on-ground events and online events, we center the critical role that art and culture play in our resistance against Israeli settler colonialism and apartheid and all struggles against oppression. Tonight, we will engage with music, dance, and spoken art and spoken words artists from all over the world dedicated to freedom and justice. Without further ado, I am honored to introduce you to all our two co-hosts two co-hosts for uh, tonight's rally, Rana Nazal and Shandi Desai. Please take the stage. Hello. Welcome everyone. It's lovely to see people in the chat coming in from all over the world, all different time zones. My name is Rana Nazal Hamadeh. I'm an artist. I use multiple mediums, photography, film, and installation to create works that present challenges to settler colonialism um, or which highlight aspects of resistance that are sometimes overlooked. I'm interested in time, in memory, in reviving histories, and the effects of colonialism on all forms of life. Um, I'm based in Ramallah right now in the occupied West Bank of Palestine, working with an organization supporting political prisoners, and I'm also working on some upcoming new artwork. And I first became involved in BDS organizing 10 years ago, during my undergrad at Carlson University in Ottawa. And this was exactly a decade ago, the Graduate Student Union there voted overwhelmingly in support of divestment from companies complicit in Israeli apartheid. And that was the context in which um, I was starting my BDS organizing as a student, and it was one of the very early wins for BDS and uh, led to so many more campaigns like it around the region. And, you know, as BDS organizers will tell you uh, all around the world, it's the intensity with which they try to repress our movement that we know that it's working. And so I salute all the students and the artists and the activists uh, who are organizing IAW right now, who are building knowledge of why divestment, demilitarizing, um, and you know, just pulling out from companies that profit off of apartheid and oppression, why this is good for all of us, why it's uniting all of us in the struggle against 
racism. So I'm really excited that this year we're celebrating the role of art in expanding our awareness and making our resistance movements exciting and irresistible and emotive. And I'm thrilled to be hosting with my colleague, Chen Jing. I will pass it over to her to introduce herself. Just one second, yeah, I'm muting. Thank you, um, thank you, Rana. Salamat, everybody. Um, I'm also very excited to be here with you all um, from different time zones and around the world. My name is Chani Desai and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. Um, my research focuses on the history of Palestinian resistance culture, particularly the PLO's cultural politics and cultural internationalism. I've also been organizing in the Palestine Solidarity Movement and particularly with BDS for the last 13 years, including organizing Israeli Apartheid Week in Toronto for 10 years, the city where um, IAW first started. Um, and I also served on the international committee um, that coordinates IAW for several years. Um, you know, as Rana talked about divestment and her time as a student, that's also the way that I came to BDS and Palestine organizing. Um, I, while I was a student um, at the University of Toronto, I was also part of the founding team of the US, U, UFT Divest campaign, um, which as Rana mentioned, has been also inspiring to many campaigns uh, beyond um, the campus. Um, I'm currently a member of Faculty for Palestine um, that is in Canada. It has been an honor to work with comrades from around the world advancing the settler colonial and apartheid analytic, which has now gone mainstream worldwide. Um, and seeing the shift and seeing the change has been uh, quite remarkable uh, because 13 years ago, it was very, very different landscape. The work of IAW and BDS organizers on a global scale has changed the terrain of our struggle as we have all collectively mobilized people of conscience to build cross-movement solidarities for liberation and a free Palestine. It has renewed energies on how also to build movements from the campus to the city, from the favelas to the townships, from the local scale to the global. This growing internationalism can be attributed to the amazing work of activists and artists that have principally organized resistance year after year against apartheid, settler colonialism and occupation and have united um, against racism globally. And so I salute all of you. We welcome you today. Um, and you know, we just want to now move to the program. So moving to the logistics, if you're watching the rally here on Zoom with us, you should see an option for translation on your screen. If you would like to access translation to Arabic or Spanish, you can click on that and choose your language. So um, just see the translation option on your screen. Now I would like to introduce our first artist of the evening, Badia Buhrizi from Tunisia. Badia uh, emerged from the Tunisian underground as a powerful female vocalist and songwriter. She has periodically been banned from performing in Tunisia because her lyrics discuss political resistance, including her performance of a song written by the Palestinian resistance poet Fadwa Tukan. And so um, if we can play Badia's performance now, that would be great. Assalamualaikum and Eskul and Badia Abu Harizi. I am a Tunisian musician, I'm a singer songwriter. I've been known for my protest songs, and uh, I consider that as not being a choice. Uh, I think it is, it, it, maybe it's my, the fact that I grow, grew up in one of those neighborhoods where you can really see the injustice going around, but um, I keep this in my heart that uh, any intellectual or what we, artist or whatever should not uh, put on the side as if it doesn't belong there the struggles to stay just in the joy joy has to be authentic and real and when it's there are there is sadness we have to express also sadness and surprise and fear and terror this is this all is our brush to paint um bds for me is a beautiful example of the palestinian effort and pacifist effort to uh, make things clear to the eyes, the public, word, public eye, 
even though I think that it has been, but now it, there is no denial of that. There is no denial of the injustice that is happening in Palestine. There is no denial of the apartheid state, the apartheid regime that is going on there. There is no denial that at least if you cannot, we, you do not have to take a weapon and go fight. You can just boycott, divest, sanctions asking for them. And this is a, a real, a real, a real weapon as well as much as art and words and protection of the Palestinian identity. And for that, I am in awe at all at the at the all those Palestinian artists who are new know really how to make politics in the sense that is when it comes to art to keep one culture alive. That's the the first political choice you have to make as a human which culture you want to, to preserve. And I think the Palestinian culture with all its richness for real has not just the right, it's our full responsibility, all of us to keep it alive and not get it lost in some kind of appropriation. Um, here I am presenting you a Sih. Sih is a song that I wrote um, just uh, after the revolution when we were a little doubting. And Sih meaning shout and Sih be the Sih kun rih. So shout be the wind. Remind them uh, of those who stood up and said no. Remind them of those and who stood up and didn't say this is not our problem. And this is our problem. This is all of our issue. So here it is, Sih, that I was made with the contribution of Action for Hope. I hope you enjoy it. Salamat.
Wow. I got goosebumps. <laughs> that was Sih by Badia Bukhrizi, if anyone didn't catch the intro. Um, I was just so moved by, you know, when I was thinking about, about this event, I was thinking about how music and art, it can make our movement so joyful and pleasant. And I was thinking of all these good feelings, but in her intro, she was talking about, you know, also making space in that music for fear, for um, terror, for doubt, for, you know, all the range of emotions that actually open up the way for joy. And that's really what stuck with me. What did you think, Chani? Yeah, I mean, I think um, in many ways, uh, she, the song really in, encapsulates the, the emotion of the struggle because um, whether it's from Tunisia during the revolution to the streets of the West Bank, um, you know, uh, people are standing up and saying no everywhere um, against, um, against um, state violence and against, you know, um, authoritarianism and, and um, terror. And the range encapsulates not only um, the way she was talking about keeping culture alive and keeping the emotions of struggle alive, but part of it is also um, beautiful in that she talks about the imaginary of freedom in a sense, right? As you really also amid the terror and amid uh, the fear, you, you know, um, stand up and, and fight. And so for me, the spirit of resistance um, is really clear in her, um, in the song. And also, also there's such a deep hope. And I think the visual imagery that she brought in, you know, with the landscape and the water and the dress, you know, the black fabrics, um, yeah. All of this also encapsulates the the hope and and sort of the um, the sumud uh, within within the struggle. And I think the last thing I just want to say is also the way she connects um, the struggles from the region and beyond. And um, and and so I, I really take um, you know the the idea the metaphor of uh, her brush to the putting um, the emotions. Uh, onto the brush to paint, um, you know, what she calls uh, um, her song around shouting um, to be the wind. So yeah, that's where mm. I'll leave it. Yeah, it really felt universal in that way. So to anyone who joined after we gave our intros at the beginning, I just wanted to remind you that you can um, see an option for translation on your screen if you've joined through the Zoom link. Um, and if you'd like to access translation to Arabic or Spanish, you click on the button, I think it's called interpretation in the Zoom bar and choose your language. So I'm delighted to introduce our next artist, Yara Hawari. She's a Palestinian writer and political commentator. She completed her PhD in Middle East politics at the University of Exeter, where she researched, where her research focused on oral history and indigenous studies. She currently works as a senior analyst at Al Shabaka, a Palestinian think tank. Yara released her first book in 2021, a novella called The Stone House, which is a vivid and haunting tale of intergenerational trauma and survival under Israeli occupation. Now Yara pulled, that, um, pulled her novella out of her personal family history to tell the story of three generations. And it's set in the immediate aftermath of the 1967 Nakba when Zionist forces occupied everything that remained of historic Palestine, as well as the Syrian Golan Heights and the Egyptian Sinai. And the Nakba forced an additional 300,000 Palestinians from their homes and land. Almost half of them had already been displaced once 19 years earlier through the violent creation of the state of Israel. With that, I'll let um, the video of Fiata come on to the screen for us. My name is Yara Hawari, and I'm going to be reading from my debut novella, The Stone House by Hajo Press. Mahmoud was 15, born only a few years after the catastrophe. Although he didn't have many distinct memories from those early years, he recalled a pervasive mood of unease and melancholy during his childhood. The adults talked about people as if they were ghosts, mourning those who were gone, but not dead. It was confusing for his young mind. 
Something bad had happened that had changed everything. Mahmoud couldn't remember when he first became conscious of it. It seemed to have always been there, as though time itself was determined by this singular point in history. Everything was either before or after the catastrophe. It was a line separating the normal from the abnormal. Mahmoud had only ever lived the abnormal. From what he could tell, the life before was a better one. Listening to his parents and grandparents, he came to carry his own, their memories of a time that was freer and full of possibility, where people traveled between Nablus, Haifa, Beirut, and Damascus. Cities then so close to each other that were now so far apart. Notions that today were wild fantasies to take a bus from Hakka to Beirut, crossing at Ras Ma'ura, were once commonplace. Since the catastrophe, hard borders had been drawn up and patrolled. Crossing them was now unthinkable. Mahmoud felt a deep longing for that time, a time that he had never lived and yet that he knew so well. It existed all around him in spoken and unspoken stories. He knew details about places that no longer existed, like the village of Azib, al Bassa, and al Kabri. Although they were in ruins, he could bring these villages to life in his mind, where he rebuilt them bustling and whole. Mahmoud also knew people he'd never met, like Imam Adel, whose lemon tree he was under strict instructions from his parents to take care of, or the Al Qadi family, in whose house he played hide and seek with his friends. Theirs wasn't the only home that stood empty, waiting for its owners to return. Many houses had fallen ruin. A few had been completely erased, leaving only the faintest outlines of foundations. The children were told not to play in these homes. People didn't talk openly about them or their owners, and Mahmoud knew better than to ask too much. He could see the pain in his parents' eyes the few times he brought them up. One of these ruined houses belonged to his father. What had happened to it and the people who lived there was a well-known story, not just in Tarshiha, but across all of the Galilee. Two and a half decades before the catastrophe, following the fall of the Ottoman Empire, Palestine had been placed under a British mandate. It was first declared as a temporary arrangement to prepare Palestinians for self-rule, but it soon became clear that this wasn't to be, as the British spent most of their time suppressing Palestinian rebellions and attempts to establish independence. At the same time, the British were facilitating the entry of Zionist settlers into Palestine from Europe, and on the eve of the 1948 war, they more or less handed over their keys and weapons to Zionist militias. Mahmoud knew of an infamous story about the Zionist commander who had bet a British general a bottle of whiskey that Zionist militias could take the city of Haifa in a week. It took them even less than a week. This was in part because the British had quickly retreated and funneled many of the city's Palestinian inhabitants to the port, where they were swiftly loaded onto boats. One of the first English phrases Mahmoud ever heard had appeared in the anecdotes of visiting relatives. To the port, to the port. The call had been blasted from loudspeakers throughout Haifa and still rang in the ears of its refugees. Though there were similar stories across Palestine's other coastal cities, and once the cities had fallen, it was only a matter of time before the villages fell too. Tarshiha was no different. It held out until the autumn of 1948, when it was eventually surrounded and cut off. The Zionist forces launched the attack in the early hours of the morning. Most of the men were in the hills forming a line of defence around the village. The few who bore weapons carried only their old muskets from the Ottoman era. The rest were armed with farming equipment and sheer courage. Rather than invade on foot, the enemy used British planes to bomb them from the sky. As the village burned, the men broke their line of defence and ran towards their houses in the hope of saving their wives and children. They returned to scenes of utter devastation. Over half of their homes had been destroyed and most of the villagers were forced to flee. Those who stayed did so to bury their dead. Mahmoud's father, Kamen, was among those who remained. He had been in the fields while the rest of the men, with the rest of the men when the bomb had fallen, while his pregnant wife and child were at the family home. They were martyred, as were nine other members of the family. After the bombing, the survivors retreated to the mountains. Some continued on to Lebanon, others stayed nearby but hidden. 
nowhere seemed safe. Darshiha was the last stronghold of resistance in the region, and its defeat signaled the fall of the entire Galilee. The, Sal the Arab Salvation Army quickly retreated to Lebanon, and other pockets of resistance collapsed. And with that, Palestine was wiped off the map. It was a catastrophe that continued to reverberate. Even now, two decades on, they hadn't recovered. Wow. It's a very moving uh, passage from her, um, her, her book. Um, this excerpt that um, Yara read for us um, really reminds me of the memories, the trans, the intergenerational memories and the transfer um, of the memories across the various generations um, that have survived um, the Nakba and um, various other catastrophes um, that Palestine has seen. And it is through this transfer of memory that, um, you know, the figure Mahmoud brings to life all that has been destroyed, but also all that remains, specifically the scenes of destruction, be it the stories of the towns, the villages, the actual stone house. Um, and it tells us the story also of the martyrs and it reminds us about the martyrs um, that were lost in the resistance. Most importantly, it also brings back nostalgia and the way Mahmoud the figure also recounts stories that are known and unknown, but also um, all that remains. And so for me, I think this aspect of what Yara writes so beautifully also encapsulates the Palestinian spirit of storytelling um, and the way stories and memories have been transferred and told um, across time, across space and across geographies. Um, Rana, what did, what did you think? Yeah, I was thinking about how it's such a such a specific story but so many people i'm sure hear their own family stories echoed in it mm -hmm. and you know my as a kid i remember thinking how many times you know i'd be in people's homes and they would just tell me a story that i was like this should be a novel like you almost don't believe it's real because reality is sometimes so distorted that you actually can struggle to believe that it's reality and mm -hmm. i am really glad that yada took the time to write her family story into this book um it really feels like she nailed like this kind of repeated perpetual state of colonization because even as we're reading and hearing this historic story you're also seeing some echoes of what's happening right now it feels contemporary as well it also feels like it could be set in the nakba like you feel like this um kind of repetition that we're stuck in as long as we are in this state of colonization yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, the repetition of the scenes of um, violence and destruction. Um, so I will move us to um, back to the virtual stage um, to the work of Estefania Vaga, uh, Vega, um, who is a Mexican actress, activist, and performer who is also BDS's Mexico's cultural representative. Um, Estefania is also the coordinator of the Nakba project and a member of Mexican Artists for Palestine. Over the last seven years, she has worked for the rights of migrants, the eradication of gender violence and the defense of the Palestinian cause. And so if we can put up Estefania's uh, performance, um, that would be wonderful. Hola, soy Estefania Vega, soy actriz, performer y activista de México. Lo que verán a continuación es un pequeño fragmento de la obra Fotografía de una nube sobre mi mano, teatro documental de figuras planas sobre el testimonio de una nube palestina. Esta es la adaptación del libro Saboreando el cielo de la autora palestina Ibtiz Ambarakat. Yo considero que no podemos hablar de libertad sin que el pueblo palestino sea libre y que también no podemos voltear la cara y no apoyar su lucha. Así como que es de suma importancia esta acción global que se realiza contra el apartheid, ya que esta es una acción de lucha por la libertad, por el territorio y por la vida. La 
la guerra nos alcanzó al anochecer. Mi madre acababa de anunciar que la cena de lentejas y arroz estaría lista en cuanto llegara mi padre. Cogí a Maja, mi hermana pequeña. Se descubrió un pecho relleno y comenzó a mecerse y alimentarla. Yo tenía tres años y medio, pero aún quería ser la que se mecía en los brazos de mi madre. Mis dos ruidosos e inseparables hermanos, Base, de seis años y medio, y Muhammad, un año más joven, corrían uno tras de otro por el jardín de verano de mi madre. Yo estaba de pie en la puerta, esperando a que llegara mi padre. Pronto le vería surgir de entre una cortina de sombras vespertinas por el camino de grava que lleva a mi casa. Como cada tarde, le esperaba para correr hacia él con todas mis fuerzas. Por fin apareció mi padre a lo lejos y fui saltando por la grava hacia él. Mi padre era mi persona favorita en el mundo y antes de la guerra tenía la sensación de que todo iría bien siempre y cuando llegara a casa el final del día. Cuando nos veíamos, me abrazaba con una espléndida sonrisa que hacía que su ojo se cerrara como una luna creciente. Mi padre me daba cinco intentos para adivinar el regalo que nos traía en el bolsillo. Si no lo adivinaba al quinto intento, me decía la primera letra de la palabra y entonces acertaba siempre. El juego era más o menos así. J, de Guashas Hindi, bolas de coco. K, de castañas, castañas en forma de escarabajo. Q, de cadena, garbanzos salados y asados. B, de bícer, semillas asadas, de girasol, calabaza y sandía. Y S, de simsim, barras de sésamo, mi regalo preferido. Rompía cada barra en pequeños pedazos para que me durara dos días. Pero el 5 de junio de 1967 mi padre no nos trajo nada. Esa tarde era él el que corría hacia mí. Y aunque estaba diciendo algo, no logré irla hasta que estuvimos cerca. ¡Yala, yala! La guerra ha comenzado. Yo no comprendía lo que quería decir, pero cada parte de mí sintió peligro en sus palabras. Al regresar corriendo, Fallé en la grava y raspé mis rodillas. Mi madre pareció saber exactamente lo que querían decir las palabras de mi padre. Su reacción me asombró. Se golpeó el rostro con ambas manos. Se clavó las uñas en las mejillas. Y después se arañó. No dijo nada. Sus ojos estaban perdidos y asustados, como si el alma se le hubiera ido momentáneamente de la cocina donde todo estaba paralizado. Después entró mi padre corriendo por la puerta de la cocina y dejó caer unas bolsas repletas de comida. Ella lloró y gritó al verle, pero él le habló con ternura, como lo hacía conmigo, al explicarme la importancia de cerrar los ojos y de dormir al apagar la lámpara de que no por las noches. Le dijo que los aviones de guerra estaban disparando contra nuestras viviendas, que lo mejor era salir a la sequía del jardín. 
mientras decidíamos qué hacer. Y la sequía. Me pegué a mis hermanos. Y dejé que mi corazón se rindiera al vigilante ritmo de nuestros alientos. Inspirábamos y expirábamos al unísono. Mis padres intercambiaron susurros ansiosos. ¿Qué podemos hacer para mantenernos a salvo de mi madre? No se puede escapar del destino. Contestó mi padre con voz afligida. Yo me acerqué a él y lo sujeté con fuerza. Sabía que algo más allá de lo que había aprendido, algo de lo que jamás comprendería, estaba a punto de ocurrir. No podía detener la guerra. No podía hablar con los pilotos y decirles que nosotros, por lo menos, no habíamos hecho nada malo. Entonces recordé aquellas palabras nuestras, escritas por un poeta nuestro, aquellas palabras que en un poema decían. Teníamos tras la verja un limonero. Sus granos amarillos brillaban como lámparas. Teníamos tras la verja un limonero nuestro. Más. Para ser adorno de sus galas. Y de adema y perfume de sus ramas. Nos lo cortaron. Nos dejaron sin nuestro limonero. Nuestros ojos no volvieron a ver la primavera. That was Estefania Vega performing an interpretation of Tasting the Sky, a story by the Palestinian author Ibtissam Barakat, who was a child during the Nakba. So it's narrating a very similar historical moment to Yara's story that we just heard. And I really felt like it, it was this, I've never really seen anything like it. It's almost like an analog animation mm. for storytelling. It's almost mm. like she's using her body, the music and these props. And I think that it's kind of the unusualness of how she presents mm. it that makes you listen more closely, um, which I think, you know, it's almost the role that artists often take. Um, you kind of process something that maybe you've heard many times before in a new way. And it just felt so humane, even even not just the human experience of what was going on, but also the experience of the trees and the land. And that line at the end, I don't want anything from this land except the land. Mm. That really stuck with me. Yeah, I, I was actually also really struck by the mode of the 
the method of, of using performance art and, and, and the layers of it, right? So you have like the figures that she brings um, through the little imagery, then you have the music in the back that's very melancholic. Um, but to me, the animation in the performance is actually the, the actual mode of the, the work, I think is, it was really powerful for this. And particularly in, in, in that process, like she really memorializes, um, she enacts a memorialization of the violence and, and really centers land. Um, and I think that oftentimes, um, you know, um, land may get abstracted from uh, what people are fighting for. And I think that she brings it back in a, in a really beautiful way. And I think the last thing about the performance I also found really, really interesting. And, I, and you brought this up in your last commentary around, you don't know temporally when it, this could be, this could be in the neck of it, but it could be now. And she does that. She has this image of the wall, right? Right behind what looks like the necks are what looks like the nekba. Um, you know, and so this sort of weaving together the lemon tree with the olive trees, the trees that were uprooted with the trees that are still there, um, the wall with the images of refugees um, or uh, people with, um, you know, sacks leaving, leaving Palestine. And so, again, um, I think the performance in this one really captivated me, but also brought us back to the centrality of land to the struggle of Palestine. Thank you, Estefania, for that submission. Our next powerful group of artists is in Funun Dabkechu from Palestine. Um, Dabke, for those who don't know, is a folkloric dance. Uh, it's usually danced in a line or in a circle, and it has its roots in, it's believed, in traditional home building, where we would make these, in the Levant, they would make these um, thick mud roofs that required a lot of pressing. And so they would bring people from all around the, the town or the neighborhood to come and stamp together. And the Dutskia made the stomping in rhythm, it made it collective, it made it fun to do this labor. Um, and in that way, it's kind of tied it's very inherently to home and to land. And Dutskia, it's not um, a set of very specific moves that have to follow the same, like um, the same uh, pattern it really allows for spontaneity. And you see this when you watch it, the dancers interact and they make decisions on the spot. And that's part of how Debke tells its stories um, through its actions, but also through the clothing. Um, the clothing was very specific to the towns and the regions and even the clothing could tell you where the story was coming from. Um, Israel has a very long history of targeting artists, of targeting cultural workers, intellectuals, poets. Uh, we've seen you know, tens of thousands of books and relics and artwork and archives stolen um, or destroyed by Israel. We've seen the banning of cultural practices. We've seen cultural centers um, and artist centers raided uh, by the Israeli military. And we've even seen arrests and even extrajudicial assassinations of Palestinian artists. The troop that we're about to introduce has had several of its dancers imprisoned by Israel over the past few decades. And I'll hand it over to Chenni to introduce them. Yeah, I'm incredibly honored and thrilled to introduce to you El, the El Fanun Dance Troupe, um, Debke Troupe. Um, they are an independent nonprofit artistic organization that is virtually entirely volunteer based. El Fanun was established in 1979 by a small number of enthusiastic, talented and committed artists. Since then, El Fanun has been crowned as the lead Palestinian dance company in Palestine, as well as among Palestinians in exile. It holds an impressive track record of over 1,000 performances locally and internationally, and I got to see them perform several times in Palestine. Um, the troupe's repertoire comprises Palestinian folkloric dance forms called Debke, in addition to more elaborate choreograph forms that embody El Fanun's own unique vision of Palestinian dance. El Fanun is widely recognized as the cultural entity that has played the most significant role in reviving and reinvigorating Palestinian dance and music folklore. Um, and so if we can have El Fanun's performance on screen. We dance our past, we dance our present, and we dance our future. 
We dance Dabke. We are El Funun, a volunteer dance group for 43 years. We are here today because of our strong belief that culture and art are tools to end the occupation and the colonization of Palestine. Palestinians have a cultural heritage that goes back to more than 3,000 years. Our culture and our collective memory are what give us the power to search and create and inspire and be inspired, to show the world that we exist and have a right to be here today, fighting for our freedom, and also to connect the young generation to their roots. We dance for Palestine, for a cause that is 74 years old. We dance for freedom. Thank you for um, that performance, uh, Alpha Noon. Um, you know, as I was thinking about um, precisely the caption that just ended the video, you know, about the, the fact that the Jordan Valley um, is under threat of annexation, um, it just reminds me about the significance of Debke um, in sort of the modern ways, right? So although the purpose of Debke originated um, from repairing the roof of a neighbor's house or around stomping the mud back during um, changing climates. In the contemporary moment, it has revolutionized into a symbol of struggle, life, and love. Um, and one of the aspects of that is the cultural erasure um, that the Zionist project has enacted upon Palestinians has been so vast, um, but also vast in terms of the kind of erasure of the land um, and the existence of the names of streets and um, the names of towns and villages by Hebrewizing the, the toponymy, 
and the geography of Palestine. And, and that has been termed by academics as toponymicide. And so as I was thinking about, you know, El Fanun's stomping of the land and the significance of that under constant erasure and the theft um, of land and, and the toponymicide of the land, it really also brings back the deep connection Palestinians have to land. Um, and that dancing is not, you know, dancing is fundamentally rooted to land and also about freedom. And so, yeah, I think the that and the musical element of a flute versus the regular kind of Debki tunes you would hear was really, really moving to the to the backdrop of um, a territory that is also under threats of annexation. What do you think, Rena? I was thinking about how a lot of the artists have brought up this idea of cultural protection and how, you know, this is something that's important for all of us, but especially for for those of us whose cultures are kind of actively being erased um, or attempted to be erased um, by these colonial powers and the ways that just holding on to them and commemorating them, but also allowing them to develop and take new forms is such a beautiful act of resistance. And I was really thinking about the versatility of Dubke when I was watching this video. You know, you see it to celebrate a wedding, to commemorate a historical day, um, or you, you know, you see it sometimes on stage in full costume. You can see it on the streets in whatever you're wearing, or in the Jordan Valley in these t-shirts and with a flute. Like it's, it really is so versatile, and it really calls on you to join in. It's hard to watch it without being part of it. Um, I'm going to take this moment actually to invite Rita back to the stage. She's going to ground us in some action that uh, all of us on this call right now can take in the next minute. Thank you, Rana and Chandi. This has been amazing, powerful, very nice, very empowering. Uh, but even in our breaks, we have actions to make, whether it's a rally on the ground or it's uh, a virtual rally. So bringing attention and awareness to Israeli apartheid week and the reality that Palestinians have been uh, naming for decades of Israeli apartheid and settler colonialism, please join us for all those who are with us on the Zoom. Click on the link in the chat and tweet to invite others to join us in our rally using the hashtags United Against Racism and Israeli Apartheid and Israeli Apartheid Week. Uh, also, please make sure you share and you check our Israeli Apartheid Week uh, web page getting to know what are the activities happening in your region, how can you organize and how can you be part of the upcoming month. Together we are stronger and together we are united. Um, help us with mobilizing to end Israeli apartheid. You can find the link uh, in the chat. So we will leave you with 60 seconds, a minute to uh, click on the tweet and share it. Thank you. My people, my people, open your eyes and answer the call of the drum. Freddy Mo, Freddy Mo, Samara Machel, Samara Machel has come. Maputo, Maputo. Home of the brave, our nation will soon be as one. Freddy Mo, Freddy Mo, Samara Machel, Samara Machel as one. Thank you, everyone. Uh, now it's my honor to introduce to you all Njungi Gizuko, a Kenyan human rights defender who considers himself an artivist as he uses art for human rights activism, including as a playwright, an actor, a songwriter, a poet, and a graphic designer. 
He uses his role as an artivist to highlight issues of human rights in Kenya and in our interconnected struggles for justice around the world. Let's get that video. The video that I did on uh, Bishop Tutu, um, together, I did it together with uh, Empress Black, who is a fellow artist. And uh, we did it because Tutu is an inspiration to the world. He's an inspiration to me. He's an inspiration to uh, all oppressed people around the world. He stood up for justice. He stood up for the rights of people. He stood up for everybody uh, in the world so that everybody can have a dignified life. So we did the song Tutu um, in commemoration of his great life. A humble man, a man who loved his people, a man who loved this world so much. So it was quite an inspiration um, to know about Tutu. Having met him once uh, in the United States of America uh, during the Reebok Human Rights Awards, um, he is a man that uh, the world must always remember. So we did the song Tutu so that we can express that he was not only known in South Africa, but also here in the little village of Muimuto. Uh, and I believe that the message will go far and wide to reach out to the people of the world so that we can also be like Archbishop Desimonde Tutu. Sante. There is no way in which injustice and oppression and evil can ever have the last word. That was Indun Gigituku and Black Empress singing Tutu. I felt like their smiles were so effective. Um, I thought that was a beautiful commemoration of Tutu's life, of um, his life, but also his legacy. You know, for most of the world, he was known for his anti-apartheid activism in South Africa. Um, and for Palestinians, he's very well known as someone who used the moral authority that he had built 
through uh, the struggle in his country to point to Israeli apartheid later and to point to the similarities and to be very bold about it in a time when um, when it was still rarer to hear people outside of Palestine speaking truth to apartheid. What did you think? Um, yeah, no, uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, Tutu's voice um, and the South African voice, but also Tutu's voice was and has been so pivotal to also making the connection that apartheid wasn't a specific um, reality to South Africa. It's also, a, and it, it, there's also a legal parameter of what apartheid is. And, um, you know, one quote that has always struck me by Tutu when speaking about Palestine, and I'm, I just pulled it up. Um, he says, I've witnessed the racially segregated roads and housing in the Holy Land that reminded me so much of the conditions we experienced in South Africa under apartheid. He says, I witnessed the systemic humiliation of Palestinian men, women, and children by members of the Israeli security forces. Their humiliation is familiar to all black South Africans who were corralled and harassed and insulted and assaulted by the security forces of the apartheid government. And so, you know, not only was he a voice, but he helped us connect, you know, the transnational um, modes of violence and, and, and reminds us how we have to also be united in the struggle against racism globally. And so, um, yeah, what a beautiful, beautiful commemoration and what a loss both to the world, but especially to the BDS movement and struggle. Um, so moving to, um, um, you know, our closing uh, performance um, or not, closing performance yet, but um, I want to, uh, before we close out with our final exciting IW announcement of the day, I'm delighted to introduce our final artist performing with us this evening is Keda Aziz. Keda was born in um, Malaysia and is considered as one of the leading female artists in the Malaysian hip hop and R&B scene. Keda starting, started writing her own music at the age of 13 and was nominated for Best New Artist at the Malaysian Hip Hop Awards in 2013. Um, she was also the first female rapper and international artist to appear on YouTube's Jakarta Cypher second session. And so if we can have um, Keda's uh, performance, that would be great. Hi everyone, my name is Keda and I'm a singer, rapper, songwriter from Malaysia. Music is art. It moves emotions. Through music, one can send positive messages and lift up the spirits and give hope to those who are suppressed. Through music, one can also create an awareness on injustice going on in the world. And through music, one can also be the voice for those who have been oppressed. Kawilang na mucho pila pila masa, kesabaran dalam beberapa fasa. Emosi tenggelam mendalam bertahan, ego mu tinggi takkan ku coba faham. So many things I should have said, cause I remember when you're trying to take my life. So many things I should have said when I could, but I could not. So many things unsaid Focused on myself Though I had a bled I'm not walking the park On a summer day Hurting me comes with a price to pay No more tears So many things unsaid Focused on myself Though I had a bled I'm not walking the park On a summer day Hurting me comes with a price to pay Kembali asal bila kau kemari Terlalu kena kau memang begini Hati berharap pilih dia jerut kau ibarat tahli Neck tight to this tight bro can't breathe Perkara mudah aku bagimu adakah kau pasti Selalu saya sudah berbunga berumudah kau cari Tak perlu ubah cara-caramu sudah aku pasti Menyakiti ku ganti rugimu tak ku kehargai So many things I should have said Cause I 
Remember when you're trying to take my heart Should have said it when I could But I would not That was beautiful. And it really feels like after watching this lineup, just I feel really struck by seeing these voices from so many different parts of the world coming together for this global rally. It really speaks to how big Israeli apartheid week has grown over the last several years. Like, it, you know, for folks who were around in the early days, this is amazing. It is on hundreds of campuses and cities these days. And it's something that we always look forward to every March. Um, and when I was listening to the video, I was thinking about, you know, music becoming the voice of um, so many movements. Uh, we see whenever, um, whenever there's like a popular struggle that emerges, um, whether it's something as big as the intifadas that we've seen or the um, you know, the bouts of resistance that happen every year or a couple of years and, you know, all around the world. Whenever we see that happen, whenever we see people take to the streets and this kind of feeling, we see amazing music come out. And I really think about music's role and, and it's kind of a symbiotic relationship, like the music fuels us and we fuel the music. And yeah, what did you think, Shani? Yeah, I mean, similarly, and, and I think the other piece around music that you bring up is just that it transcends language um, and it transcends borders and it transcends um, emotions, right? And so, you know, as a Malaysian female artist, I'm also reminded of the amazing Palestinian hip hop artists and the amazing Palestinian female spoken word and hip hop artists that, you know, we have um, within... Um, within this, this uh, movement and struggle. And also the relevance of um, trying to speak to a, a, a younger generation. And culture has been such a central site of resistance for Palestinians, but also has been a central site for organizing and bringing people to Israeli Apartheid Week. And pedagogically, it's been used, you know, so, as, as, as a way to also make people that you know, haven't understood what this is about to come through culture because art and culture can grab the attention of anyone. They can read a story, they can, you know, view a film, they can um, listen to a song and feel a connection and an understanding to justice that perhaps a lecture might not do. And so in many ways, um, yeah, it's absolutely beautiful to also see the way culture has been a central part of this struggle and um, it not only is an educative force, but it's and a resistive force, but it also keeps um, our souls and our spirits alive as we as we struggle for for freedom and um, justice. And so, yeah. Can we get the final slide up on the screen? Because we're closing up. Um, for anyone who joined a little bit late, the recording of the event will be posted on the BDS and the IAW. Uh, social media, so you can keep an eye out for that. And if you look at the screen right now, there's the link to the Israeli Apartheid Week global calendar with the events for um, the events happening in countries all around the world for Israeli Apartheid Week, most of them happening this month. And if there isn't one happening in your city, you can check out the IAW organizing guide at the second link that's up there. And this is a guide that will help you basically organize in your own city. So um, 
most BDS and IAW activists know. It's a very decentralized movement in that way, united by a commitment to the same principles, but um, decentralized in the sense that anyone who's listening to this call can organize IAW. And so just check out that guide to find out a little bit more about what that means. Yeah. And um... yeah, <laughs> to close us out, we're going to um, bring some music out. So this week marks the four year death uh, anniversary of Rimbanna. Um, such a tremendous loss um, for Palestinian um, communities everywhere. Rimbanna was a prominent artist mm -hmm. who sang songs for freedom for um, political prisoners, for revolution and justice and so much more. And she had such a beautiful voice and even a way of speaking. We're gonna end with one of her songs. It's called Yatala'in al-Jabal, for those going to the mountain. Mm -hmm. Yatala'in is a song that was sung by a Palestinian woman who would visit their loved ones in prison. And they do something, they kind of insert a code into the song. They add the letter L followed, followed by a vowel. And it kind of confuses the way um, the words sound so that anyone who isn't a native Arabic speaker would have trouble following what they're saying. And this was used to confuse the jail guards who were usually foreign invaders, uh, whether the Ottoman or the British or the Israelis. And they would basically be able to pass information to, um, to their loved ones who were imprisoned. For example, telling them when they might be freed or broken out by their comrades. So Reem Banna's commemoration to this song, it just really highlights the role of songs in resistance in bringing people together across the enforced divide of challenging systems of power and of the role of women in preserving the songs and the stories that are passed on. Uh, we'll bring that up, but do you have any closing thoughts, Jenny? Yeah, no, just how significant she is and, and how symbolic it is that we're also marking her her um you know her her death anniversary um mm. as we as we close out the global rally so i just wanted to on behalf of all the organizers of this event and um you know just to thank everyone for being here for joining the rally for being part of israeli apartheid week for um all the work that you do and uh we you know, hope that you continue to um, get involved if you're not involved and if you are involved to continue um, to do the work that you're doing uh, from whichever cities that you're in. So uh, continue to follow the Israeli Apartheid Week website, the BDS Movement's website for updates. Um, and otherwise, you know, thank you for being here. Um, and we salute you all for your work. يا طالعين عين للجبل يا مول الموكدين النار بين لليمن يا مان عين للهنا يا روح يا طالعين عين للجبل يا مول الموكدين النار بين لليمن يا مان عين للهنا يا روح ما بدي من كيل لكم خلعة ولا لا 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 بدي ملبوس بين لليوم يامان عين للهنا يا روح ما بدي من كيل لكم خلعة ولا لا 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 بدي زنار بين لليوم يامان عين للهنا يا روح يا طالعين عين للجبل يا مول الموكدين النار بين لليوم يامان عين للهنا يا روح إلا غزال للي ذي جوين للي كم محبوس بين لليوم يامان عين للهنا يا روح إلا غزال للي ذي جوين للي كم ميدوم بين لليوم يامان عين للهنا يا روح يا طالعين عين للجبل يا مول الموكدين النار بين لليوم يامان عين للهنا يا روح يا طالعين عين للجبل يا مول الموكدين النار بين لليوم يامان عين للهنا يا روح يا طالعين عين للجبل يا مول الموكدين النار بين لليوم يامان عين للهنا يا روح 
build Thank you, everyone. That's Stay tuned for more. Have a good night or day. Good morning, Hi, everybody. <laughs> or morning. <laughs>